Thank you, Carol, for that very lovely introduction. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here um, in Edinburgh and also following Ginola's talk. Um, I'm going to talk today about, uh, towards a new science of autism, um, building a participatory framework. So let me start in a perhaps surprising place and away from autism altogether. It's something that you psychologists in the room might remember from your Psychology 100 days. So these stimuli here are a take on Solomon Asher's famous conformity experiment that he conducted back in the 1950s, where he gave participants a perceptual matching task, a very simple task, where he simply asked people to match, or which of the, he, to make a judgment, which of those three lines, in this case snakes, match the, the one on their own, on its own. And those of you who will remember the, the study will know that he didn't just ask the participants to do this on their own. He asked, he asked the participants to do this in the presence of other people. So he set up this experiment where he had the real participant and he had fake participants or confederates that were essentially um, in on the experiment and were there to shake things up a bit. And so in the experiment, he had the, he had the fake participants and he went around the room and he asked them to say aloud which one of those three lines best matches the one on the other side. And then finally, he gets to the real participant and the real participant has to say aloud their answer. Um, and what he found was that upon hearing other people's responses to this otherwise very simple question, the real participant often modified their responses on the basis of what the other people thought, the fake participants thought. That is, they ended up saying that rather than the line looking like the first one, that it looked like the second or third line, which is actually very hard to see that you could possibly do, but, but people did it in the experiment. Now, the point of this experiment was to show how deeply worrying people's tendency to conform is, so much so that people even get a very simple task like this wrong, um, when they're influenced by other people. Now, coming on, coming on the back of the Second World War, this made psychologists deeply worried about how apparently easy it is to influence people. Now, zoom forward 50 years or so, and some people um, recently had the very interesting idea to do the same experiment with people on the autism spectrum. So, in, the, in this study, children were given, autistic children were given Asher's um, um, conformity task, but rather than lines, they were given these particular snake stimuli. And rather fascinatingly, the children on the autism spectrum seem not to be as led astray by the information from the confederates or the fake participants. They were more likely to get the lengths of the snakes right, that is, to resist the pressure for social conformity. Now, when I first read that paper, I kind of thought, oh, I wonder what so um, Solomon Ash would think, who he, what he would make of it. Um, surely, he would be delighted. Um, that there were some people out there that actually get the answer right, that aren't led astray um, because of peer pressure. Imagine my amazement then when I started hearing other people talking about the study and the results of the study. Um, colleagues who I really like and admire had started to say that it was the autistic people who were somehow weird for getting it right, rather than everyone else being weird for getting the judgment wrong. And I've heard it again and again, and it's not just the results of this study, but loads of other studies too, including my own, um, where the response that characterizes the autistic people is somehow labeled wrong, even when it's right. I think that tells us a lot about researchers' attitudes towards autism and their tendency to take the non-autistic perspective as the norm. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. So, um, in my talk, I want to talk about whether the attitudes that I've just talked about stop us, doing, stop us from doing our research and our practice well, um, and some ways that we might go about um, um, addressing that or shifting it. So, my first question, I'm going, to address th I'm going to kind of pose three questions. So, my first question that I want to consider is what attitudes shape autism research, or who gets to decide what gets researched? I'll move on to considering who gets to decide the terms that we use to talk about autism. And finally, who gets to decide the kind of practices that are used to intervene with autistic people. I'll conclude by offering a, an alternative way to transform the future of autism research and, and, and hopefully the future lives of autistic people. So the first question is who gets to decide what gets researched? 
Well, let's start with the good news. Um, in the past decade, there's been a huge explosion in autism research. Now, this graph, I'll, I'll talk you through this, comes from the, the um, United States Interagency Autism Coordinate, Coordinate, Coordinating Committee. Um, and the vertical line, you'll see, represents number of peer-reviewed journal publications. And on the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, we've got time. So that's 1980 all the way to 2010. Now, what I want you to focus on is the blue line. The blue line represents autism publications. Um, and what I hope you can see is that, you know, around 1980, there are about 200 papers per year d targeted on autism, d dedicated to autism. If we zoom forward to 2010, we now have about 2,500 papers every year on autism, which Ed Fred, Fred Volker said this morning is very, very difficult to keep up with. Um, but this growth in research, in autism research, far surpasses growth in other related areas. So the orange line that you can see is related areas like developmental psychiatry, psychology, um, paediatrics, um, which, aren't, which have you know, steadily increased over the years but haven't got um, such, a, such a spurt as, as, as in autism. Um, so there's a lot of autism research going on. Um, which, if put into practice, could transform the lives of autistic people and their families. But is this research actually making a difference? The, we know that the opportunities and life chances of autistic people are, are so often severely limited in comparison to non-autistic people. Um, autistic people are less likely to ever have a well-paying job or a job at all um, compared to non-autistic people. Many have problems in their social lives and often struggle with their um, physical and material well-being. Um, so there seems to be, it, it's, you know, not, uh, the, the amount of research um, that's going on doesn't necessarily kind of transpire to, to everyday people's lives. To get our head around why there might be such a mismatch between um, all that research going on and, um, and why autistic people and their families don't feel as if much is getting better, Tony Charman and I did a study, which was funded by Research Autism, um, looking at what kind of research is going on in the UK. And in particular, we were interested in how much money went towards autism research, and in particular, which areas in which it was invested. Um, so what we did is we looked at all the um, funding portfolios of every, of every funding organisation in the UK from 2007 and 2011, and then we applied a classification system to those particular um, uh, uh, funding funded projects. Now this looks like a really scary diagram and I don't want you to focus on that. I want you to focus on the, he the coloured hexagons. So essentially we got each of those funded projects and we classified them according to whether they were on diagnosis and screening tests, early signs, whether they were on um, biology, brain, cognition, neural pathways, sensory and motor functions, etc whether they looked at causes, that could be genetic causes, environmental causes, the interaction between the two, whether they were on treatments and interventions, and that included the whole gamut of interventions from behavioral interventions to drug trials, um, whether they were on services, and this could be kind of service delivery, but also practitioner training and, uh, and family services, and also whether they were on societal issues, so social and ethical issues, um, autobiographical research, um, research on the economics of autism, et cetera. Um, and so we were interested in, in which of these six categories attracted the most money. Now, some of you might have heard me talk about this before, so you'll know the answer. Um, but what I want to uh, just th have a think, you have a think for 10 seconds about where you think um, the UK spent most of its research money on autism. Who thinks they spent, so put up your hand, who thinks they spent, um, who thinks we spend m most of the money on diagnosis? Nobody? Biology, brain, and cognition? About half, a third of you? Uh, causes? Ooh, no, man, another quarter. Um, treatments and interventions? A couple. <laughs> Services? Yeah, even fewer. And societal issues? Only, only one. <laughs> so this is what we found. You did pretty well, actually. Um, so we found that the majority, if you actually add together biology, brain, and cognition, and causes, over 70% of UK autism um, funding went towards understanding the underlying biology and, um, and causes of autism, 
Only 5% went towards under understanding the most effective services for autistic people and their families, and only 1% went towards understanding the place of autism in society. The same goes, if, um, the same kind of pattern goes for autism publications. We had some wonderful research assistants who categorised thousands of autism publications according to that same scary diagram. And this is what we found. So we were able to compare um, publications from researchers in the US, which is the dark purple, UK, which is the kind of middle purple, and, for, and from European colleagues um, in the light purple. And essentially you get a very similar pattern. There's a predominance of, um, of um, autism research going into kind of underlying, uh, understanding the underlying biology um, of autism. So that's what's going on in current autism research. Um, but what does this actually say about the underlying attitudes towards autism and what matters for autistic people? So as part of this research, we then did a large-scale survey with autistic people, their family members, practitioners, and researchers. And we asked them, we didn't give them that scary diagram that I showed you. Instead, we broke it down a little bit um, into 13 different questions. And you might not be able to read them. But I'll just read a couple out. So we asked them things like, how common is autism? Are there different types of autism? Um, um, what are the best ways to treat or are the symptoms of autism, etc.? And we asked people to rate the relative importance of those questions on a five-point scale. So um, one was like not very important at all, and five was really important. And you probably can't see these numbers either. But the, um, what we found was that actually all of, the, uh, all of our participants rated all of the questions pretty highly. So they all thought that they were pretty um, important, which is unsurprising because we don't really know the answers to any of these questions. Um, but there were three clear winners. The first was how do autistic people think and learn? The second was how do public services best meet the needs of autistic people? And the third was, what are the best ways to improve the life skills of autistic people? Um, there, was, there was also actually remarkable agreement across all the four groups. So autistic people, um, parents, um, practitioners, and even researchers, even though they weren't actually focusing on those questions. Um, uh, the only point of difference was autistic people, autistic adults, who also thought the question, what does the future hold for autistic adults? They rated that very highly. And this is what people said. So one 28-year-old autistic woman said, we need to know how to work with the services to make sure everyone has a chance of having a better life. A mother said, we need to understand the most effective ways to educate autistic children and provide life skills while respecting them as individuals. Another mother said, I want to understand more about how my child sees the world so I can better understand his response to it. And a sister said, Research needs to be carried out and put into ways to teach life skills and social rules to create more independence for adulthood. Importantly in our study, it's not that people didn't value basic biomedical research. Um, it's just that they wanted more research on those areas that affect the day-to-day -day lives of autistic people and their families. Research on public services, research on life skills, research on cognition and learning, and the place of autistic um, individuals in society. And this is in stark contrast to what is actually being researched by autism researchers around the world. So what we end up with is a huge mismatch between what is researched and what people want to be researched. Which raises the question, why is there a mismatch? So some autistic adults, when we, when we, when we spoke to them in focus groups and in interviews, they noted that the research being done represented neurotypical priorities regarding us, not autistic people's priorities. Others emphasised that the research failed to speak to the reality of their lives in the here and now. One parent said, you know, that's all researchers are interested in. What causes it, what causes it? Doesn't say much for the kids that have already got it, does it? Um, so one reason for the mismatch is different attitudes towards autism research. Researchers were apparently driven towards understanding causes, while autistic people and their families wanted research that focused on more immediate practical concerns. A related reason for the mismatch between what is researched and what the aut autistic community want researched is the lack of involvement in research by members of the autistic community. When we ask people, it was part of the research, we also ask people about how their experiences of actually being involved in research 
beyond being a kind of passive participant. We wanted to know whether they'd actually be in, involved in the research process, in the design of the research, in implementing research, in analysing or even um, interpreting the findings and disseminating them. When we asked people about this, the majority of researchers said that they frequently or very frequently engaged in public dissemination and dialogue with members of the autistic community, but only a minority of autistic people, family members and practitioners actually shared that view. They didn't really feel that they were being engaged in that way at all. All groups of respondents, however, agreed that active research partnership um, or co-production of research was a rare occurrence. And this is what some people um, said about their experiences. Now, they talked about different attitudes, asymmetric interactions, and different priorities. So one researcher said, the people making judgments about research and research funding have to be other scientists. A practitioner said, I don't think many researchers feel they can talk to autistic people as if they matter. They're too busy studying them like specimens or looking for a cure. Other people talked about asymmetric interactions. So lots of parents talked about, which is rather disheartening listening to this, but they talked about, you know, researchers are more keen on collecting data, not providing results. Lots of parents kind of said, you know, I give my information, I give my child's information all the time, and I never hear anything about the results. A lot of autistic adults talk, um, used a zoo metaphor. So one adult said, sometimes we're a bit like monkeys in a zoo. There was rats in a cage, guinea pigs, um, monkeys. Um, really, feel, really feeling quite disenfranchised by the research process. And then we also had different priorities. So one parent said, most researchers operate from ivory towers with very little contact with real autism. And one practitioner said, researchers are far too interested in causes and cures with intellectual understanding only and no practical application. In one of the focus groups that I did with um, autistic adults, um, one adult said to me, you know, rather skeptically, whatever we say, is it really going to influence anyone? So this real feeling of kind of being disempowered um, in the research process. So with this lack of involvement in research, a lack of involvement in the decision-making processes around research, it's not really surprising that there should be such a mismatch between what, is, what research is going on and what research people want to be going on. Okay, so that's my first question. That was my, um, um, who gets to decide what, um, what gets researched in autism. My second question, um, I, uh, I wanna move on really here to talk about something that I think reveals and shapes the attitudes towards autism even more profoundly and that is the very terminology that we use when we talk about autism. You know, that we as researchers, as clinicians, as educators, as, as parents, as autistic people. Um, I think there's no better place to start this discussion than by a very controversial campaign by the American charity Autism Speaks a few years back. So I'm just gonna play a video, um, or play some of it, I won't play all of it. Assuming it works. I am autism. I'm visible in your children, but if I can help it, I am invisible to you until it's too late. I know where you live, and guess what? I live there too. I hover around all of you. I know no color barrier, no religion, no morality, no currency. I speak your language fluently, and with every voice I take away, I acquire yet another language. I work very quickly. I work faster than pediatric AIDS, cancer, and diabetes combined. And if you are happily married, I will make sure that your marriage fails. I think I'll stop it there. <laughs> um, it goes on, and you'll have your own views about what you've just seen. But one thing I think is very clear is that there is nothing very positive in that depiction of autism, funded by one of the world's um, biggest autism funding bodies. Now, here are some of the terms that we use in our everyday language to describe autism. So we say things like deficit, disorder, difference, dysfunction, weakness, um, spectrum. We say low functioning, we say high functioning. We say child with autism, person with autism. We say autistic, we say has Asperger's syndrome. We say autism spectrum disorder, autism spectrum condition, and it goes on. There's lots of ways to describe um, people, which is all a bit confusing, I think. Um, 
And in my centre, we see you know, lots of um, people, um, parents and, and, and practitioners and autistic people coming through. And, and one of the things we often you know, talk about is how we should refer um, to autism or, or, or to the person we're talking about. Um, and some people might find this rather trivial. Um, you know, it's just a word. Um, but um, if it's describing you, it you know, it's, 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 might not be so trivial. We're talking about real people. Um, and we don't really even have an, a, an agreed way to talk about them. So I'm going to focus on two ways, two rival ways, that have been suggested to kind of cut through this confusion and finally settle on ways to describe people. So number one, in efforts to be inclusive, person-first language has become what's called for. So calling someone a person with autism, describing what a person has, not what a person is. And in many countries across the world, this has become the officially recommended way to speak with or about disability. In the press, in journal articles, hospitals and schools, you say, I'm a person first, not a disability. But many disabled people have argued vehemently against the use of person first language, um, instead preferring disability first language or identity first language, such as he or she is an autistic person. Now, Jim Sinclair, an, an, autism, an autistic activist, argues that autistic people can never and should never be separated from their autism. You can't kind of like pluck it out from somebody. Um, and Lydia Brown, who's another autistic activist in the US, you know, says autism can be something to be positive about, even if it's always challenging. You know, she talks about um, the way that we use language. Um, so some people say, you know, we, we never say a person with beauty we say a beautiful person. Um, so why do we say person with autism? It has a kind of negative connotation in the way that we actually use the, um, the, the, the noun. So we asked, to, to try and understand this issue, together with the National, with Carol, in fact, with the National Autistic Society, we asked more than um, 3,400 members of the UK's autistic community, autistic adults, parents, um, practitioners and clinicians and researchers, about the terms they preferred to use and their reasons for doing so. Um, so, um, did they prefer to use autistic person, or person with autism, or person who, ha who has autism? Now, <laughs> perhaps unsurprisingly, it turned out that no term was unanimously um, preferred across all groups, so there was lots of disagreement. Um, but there were distinct preferences um, for some, from some of the groups, and in particular, autistic adults and parents preferred the term autistic. And these are the kind of reasons they gave. So one autistic adult said, in describing someone who's autistic as a person with autism, a person who has autism, or worst of all, a person who suffers from autism, you imply that autism is separate from a person and behind their autism is a normal person. And one parent said, autism is who and what and why these people are. You cannot separate these concepts. Clinicians and educators, however, disagreed. Most, more professionals reported using person-first terms, so person with autism, has autism, has Asperger's, than other disability-first terms. And here were some of the reasons they gave. So one practitioner said, I don't like phrases which describe a person as their condition, so would always go for person-first because that's what we all are, regardless of what conditions we have. I would never describe myself as a thyroidy, for example. Another um, practitioner said, we need to describe the individual and ASD as separate entities with the emphasis on the individual, not the disorder. So, what do we do? <laughs> We've got all this disagreement. Um, I think this is a huge challenge um, for all of us who are touched by autism. I mean, take a second to think about what you do. How, how do you talk about autism? Imagine that you have an, a parent of a newly diagnosed um, child and you know, asks how, how, you should, how they should refer to their child. What, we, what would you say? Here's what I think um, as a result of doing the research. I think given the lack of agreement um, across the different groups and even within the different groups, I think we should always seek to establish how people wish to be described by asking them directly if that's possible and not impose external views or guidelines upon them. And surely it's not too difficult to argue that truly inclusive language should be defined by the people who are actually autistic. So that's what I would do. 
Um, so they're my first two questions on what kind of autism research gets done and why, and then how we talk about autism. So before we close, I just want to talk about one final issue, and that's who gets to decide the practices we use to intervene with autistic people. I'm going to give you two examples from my own research to illustrate um, this issue. And the first comes from a study that we did um, a while back with an educational psychology doctoral student of mine. Um, and we were essentially interested in how um, um, what the, the friendship experiences of a, of a group of um, children in um, upper primary school, in mainstream schools in inner city London. And it, you'll know that we, we, essentially we focused on a small number of children. We had 12 autistic children, um, but we got a lot of information from those children, from the children themselves, but also their parents and, the, and their teachers and their classroom peers. One of the things we were interested in is how included they were um, in their classrooms. And this is just one of the social network maps um, that, we, um, that, we, that was from one particular um, classroom um, in, in the study. And you'll note here that there are three names. That's Caitlin, Zane, and Lucy. And they're the three autistic children in this particular class. All the other tasks, classes only had one autistic child. This is a bit um, unusual, but I think it really serves to illustrate the variability within a class, but also with, with, within the whole group. So what I, what, what I want you to see is that um, Caitlin and Zane are highly connected members of high status groups. So they're pretty well connected in their, in their classroom to other, to other non-autistic children. Lucy, on the other hand, who's down the bottom, she's on the periphery of the social network. She's kind of only connected actually to one other child in her class. Um, and this was kind of, the, again, the, there was lots of variability. Some children were really highly connected and others weren't. And we were interested in trying to understand, well, why is that? There? Why is there this variability? Um, what, what might explain it? And we looked at various factors that might explain it, including theory of mind and verbal ability, et cetera, but none of it did. Um, but what did explain it, what seemed to explain it, at least, were, in part, was children's motivation to establish and maintain their friendships. Um, so, you know, to make and keep, children's wanting to make and keep friends. Um, and I've just got some, some um, quotes to really illustrate this. So this is Henry, who's in year five. And he says, sometimes I've got nobody. The two boys play with the two girls. I try to watch. I want more friends because there are no new people in the class. Only new people be my friend. The other people don't want to be my friend. Which is rather sad because, you know, he clearly wants, and wants to have friends. And then we have James in year six. He says, I'm happy with my life right now. I am not friendly and talkative, but I'm not not friendly. I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, next, we asked the teachers and the parents about their perceived role in supporting the friendships of the autistic children with the aim of making them more social. And here is what some of them had to say. So this is the teacher about Stuart. She said, if you went out into the playground, he'd be on his own more often than not. That would worry me. If I did go on to playground duty, he'd be sitting under a tree or just sitting somewhere. So I would go and have a chat to him and try to get him involved in a game or something. And this is a teacher about Lucy. So if you remember the social network, Lucy was the one who was the least connected in the classroom. Um, the teacher says, I say, Lucy, do you want people to like you? She'll say, yes. Do you know how to get people to like you? She says, I've got to be nice to them and let them join in. She wasn't actually very good at that. Um, and the teacher said, you know, she, she says all the right things, but then you don't see it in practice in the playground. Um, and we also asked parents who, who took some different views. So here are some quotes from them. This is a parent about Caitlin. Caitlin was one of the highly connected um, children. And she says, I make sure that almost every music club, basketball, you know, anything that's available, I make sure she gets into it to help her. And church and parties, I try to take her out as much as I can. And then we have a parent about Kieran, another boy. Um, and she said, I just pushed him last year to invite children home to play. And then this year, I thought, no, maybe he don't want to get a friend. I don't know. I can't push him too hard to get a friend. He might be upset, like if I'm saying all the time, oh, haven't you got a friend? Just bullying him all the time. And this last quote really brings me to my point. All of the teachers and all of the parents expressed a great desire to ensure that um, 
that the autistic children were fully included in their classrooms and enjoyed similar sorts of um, friendships and interactions with peers as the non-autistic children do, because that's what we believe that they should want. However, that isn't what Kieran wanted. And um, it also isn't what Eleanor wanted. So this is um, Eleanor's mum saying, I tried doing brownies with her and it was just too painful for her. She had to sit in a circle and talk and she just hated it. Indeed, some of the children reported not wanting to play with other children at playtime or lunchtime, despite the best efforts of, of teachers and teaching assistants to encourage such, such interactions. They had just spent all of the intervening time in the classroom interacting with others, which they found very effortful and stressful. And when they got to you know, out, out the playtime and lunchtime, they just wanted to be on their own and de-stress. And, and Daniel says, you know, sometimes I just want to play by myself. I hope this example raises um, what I think are quite subtle, um, but nevertheless critical ethical issues. So we, as, as teachers, as parents, as non-autistic people, want autistic children, young people and adults, um, to be part of our social world. And so we do, you know, as much as we possibly can, we facilitate their social interactions in the playground, or we get them into as many kind of after-school groups or clubs as we can, in order to increase their social competence, because that's what we believe they should want. But in doing so, I think we often fail to think about what the child might want him or herself, which in some cases could put them at risk of harm. And this phenomenon is just an example, um, but I think it serves to show that we need to be very careful about placing our non-autistic ideals and perspectives on the children and young people and adults with whom we work. I think it calls into question any certainty we might have thought we had as to if, when, and how we should intervene. And these ethical issues don't go away as children grow into adults. The second example I want to briefly share with you relates to a study we've just completed with Serena Cribb from the University of Western Australia and Lorcan Kenny from my centre in Cray. Following up a group of um, young autistic people and their families who I first saw in Perth, Western Australia when they were about four or five years old. Um, so 12 year, over 12 years ago. Um, and when we saw them recently, on the cusp of adult, adulthood, they're about 16, 17, 18, um, we interviewed the young people and their parents about what their lives are like now and what they want for their future lives. One of the things that has come up in the interviews is central to what I'm talking about today. This, this potential disparity between what parents and others want for their autistic children and what the young people themselves want. And I'm just going to give you two examples from, from two different families. So this is a, um, this first comes from a father of a 17-year-old who's cognitively able, um, verbal um, young, man, young autistic man. And the, and, the, and the dad says, I guess we've been a little bit disappointed socially on that respect. Like, he's only kept friends, a couple of friends from school. He seems disinterested. I worry socially about him in the future. I'd love him to be independent and develop his own social life. The young man himself says, I'm very sort of in my own head type of person. Didn't really, I still don't, socialise a whole lot outside of school. I wouldn't mind being more social, but I don't think I have to, or that I'm not as social as I could be. And the next um, example is from a, um, a family, um, from a mother and, and her son, again, a cognitively able young man, um, who I remember actually very vividly, um, this is the, the, them talking about um, separately, a, um, one of his repetitive behaviours. So when I first saw him when he was about four, he would have a toy and he would be running up and down the house you know, for, for, to his heart's content. Um, and the mother says, you know, he still runs back and forth with the toy. He just can't shake that habit. We thought he'd grow out of it, but he hasn't. And that's probably not going to fit in with society later in life. He knows he's doing it. He knows that he shouldn't do it. It's socially unacceptable. But he just can't stop it. And we spoke to the young man about this. And he said, the running with the toy, it's actually complicated even to me. I've done it for so long that I can't even remember what it does. It's just become a habit. Most of the time, the toy is just there because I like to hold something. I just enjoy the way it makes me feel. Now, you'll have your own views about these perspectives, um, but I really want these to illustrate, um, what I want, really want for these um, quotes to illustrate, is the differences that exist between 
what these particular parents want for their children, that is to be more connected to, to others, to be more accepted by others, to, be, to, to conform more um, to society's norms, and what the young people themselves want. I think these tensions, these conflicts, these uncertainties are ever present in our everyday lives. And it's the way in which we deal with them that matters most. So there are my three questions. Um, let me end with a few thoughts about how we might tie that all together and begin to work with autism differently. And here I'm going to talk about kind of building a participatory framework. I'm going to focus mainly on that in terms of research, but it applies equally to practice. So there's been a real push in other health-related areas, kind of biomedical areas, to involve what people call patients and the public um, or community members in the research process. And the idea behind this is if we actually get people involved in the research process, not just being passive participants, but actually being involved in the design of the process, the research, um, the implementation, the interpretation of the findings, and even the dissemination, We'll get research that is more thoroughly relevant to patients and communities. We'll get research that is sufficiently tailored to the realities of people's everyday lives. And we'll get research that is consistent with their values. Um, this is just, um, I'm sorry, so we'll also get research that is um, carried out with or by community members rather than to, about, or for them. Now, this is the way that um, research, this is just a very simplified, very simplified model of um, community involvement or citizen engagement. Um, but I think, it, I think it's easy to kind of um, relate to. So the, this is a, called a ladder of participation, um, where the rungs of the ladder reflect increasing levels of participation and degree of, um, of, of control in decision making. So I'm going I'm to relate this to research in particular, or autism research. So at the bottom, we've got kind of therapy or, 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 or kind of um, 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 manipulation, which would be no power in the decision-making processes to research. We then move up into kind of degrees of tokenism, where we might have a bit of consultation, a bit of dialogue with members of the autistic community about research. Could be tokenistic, because we might not even um, take them into consideration, but we, we still have those consultations. And then we move up the rungs of the ladder and we, and we, um, to higher degrees of um, citizen involvement. Um, and at the very top, um, where, where the decisions made around research are made by us the user groups or communities themselves. In my center, I think we're in the middle. I think we're in the middle. We're trying to move up into the green bit. Um, and there's a whole range of reasons why I think that's really hard to do. Um, but again, you might want to think where you are um, and where you might want to be um, in terms of your research, but also your practice about how much you involve um, family members or autistic people in, in the kind of um, decisions that really affect them. And these are the, some of the kinds of issues that, you know, the, this raises, you know. Um, should we actually involve the autistic community in all of our research? Is that feasible? Is it appropriate? How do we ensure, I mean, we've already heard from some of the things I've talked about, that there are many and diverse voices. Um, how do we ensure that they're all heard in the process? Um, uh, including those, especially, um, who use means of a communication other than verbal language, who might not be able to communicate themselves so effectively. What would and should involvement look like? How do we actually involve autistic people in the research that we do, or in our service delivery? How do we, importantly, how do we fund re such research? I get paid for doing autism research, um, but they, um, autistic people and their family members don't um, get paid for their kind of experiential expertise. Um, so those are just some kind of outstanding issues that I'm, I'm not going to attempt to answer, really. Um, except to say that I have two concrete suggestions about how we might actually move forward um, and move up that ladder and, and increase the level of involvement, autistic involvement in our research and practice. The first is I think we need to, we need, we must give young autistic people and adults the opportunity to voice their views and perspectives, their wants and needs, even for those, and perhaps especially for those who, who are um, less able to communicate those so effectively. And we, um, I think we need to be very careful about placing our non-autistic ideals of what we believe to be the right way of doing things, and we need to listen. Um, and this, I think, is really, really beautifully reflected by um, this quote from uh, Ari Nehman, who's an um, autistic self-advocate in the US and a friend of mine. 
He said, you know, in the, in the world we live in, disabled people are always just around the corner, but never in the room. We talk about disabled people, about autistic people, but very rarely with them. So my first concrete suggestion is that we have to engage with people. But I think we need to do more than just listen. We also need to connect at a deep and sustainable level. From the young people and adults that I work with, it's clear that we need to be much more sensitive to these individuals' capabilities and potential disabilities. Autistic people rightly demand acceptance, respect, and understanding. And I think in order to deepen our ability to respond to their needs, we first of all need to develop our relationships with them. This means connecting at a deep and sustainable level in the clinic, in the home, in school, and in the research lab. Of course, we see autistic people, you know, some of us see every day, all the time, but how much do we really know about them as people? Their likes and dislikes, their hopes and dreams. That's what a relationship is. Um, and I think, um, yeah, this is, it, it, this, is, this is what we need. We need to be more relational. So they're my two suggestions, to engage autistic individuals and to develop relationships with them. I think only through developing these relationships can we truly hope to get anything right. When I started doing this work on kind of more social and ethical issues um, you know, five, six years ago, discussions and debates around involving autistic people in conversations about them were incredibly rare. But as some of you may have noticed, things are beginning to change. In the, only the last couple of years, two major books have caused a huge storm across the world, um, Andrew Solomon's Far From the Tree and um, Steve Silverman's Neuro Tribes. If you haven't read them, you should. Um, to me, it seems as if we're truly at the beginning of a new era of thinking about autism. But as ever, change doesn't really come from academics and intellectuals. It comes from all the people willing to work together to make their voices heard. So in the United States, we've had almost 10 years of acti activism and campaigning from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and other self-advocacy organisations here in the, um, the UK, but also across Europe. As researchers, clinicians and educators, we need to do what we can to stand together and support their cause wherever we may be in the world. By doing so, I really think we can transform the future of autism research and practice and ultimately the future lives of autistic people. Thank you very much.